Okay, hello everyone. My name is Tabitha Brown. I think most of you know me, but for anyone that may be watching later on um, that doesn't know me, I am a PGY1 pharmacy resident here at Erlinger Health System. And today I'm going to be explaining how blenitumumab has impacted the treatment of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, both in pediatric patients and adult patients. Before I get started, I'd like to give everyone some insight as to why I chose this topic and why I feel like it's an important topic that should be covered. Pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia is one of the great success stories in modern medicine. So once a completely fatal disease has now reached cure rates up to 90%. So this is a big impact of therapies just like blenitumab and other immunotherapies. So just before I get started, I want to remind everybody that I have nothing to disclose financially or personal relationships with commercial entities that I may reference in my presentation. My objectives for this presentation are to discuss the pathophysiology, clinical presentation, and treatment of treatment strategies of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, identify the role of blenitumumab in ALL, and then outline key characteristics of blenitumumab. Before we get started, I feel like it's important to discuss what exactly is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So it's important to know how it how it occurs and how often it occurs. So it is a relatively rare and aggressive hematologic malignancy. It's characterized by the presence of too many lymphoblasts or lymphocytes in the bone marrow or peripheral blood. It arises from malignant B or T cell progenitor cells. So you're all looking at me like, what in the world is going on? So let's back up a little bit. So what is the bone? So the bone has many different parts of it. So there's a compact bone on the outside, spongy bones at the end of each bone, and then there's bone marrow that runs to the middle with blood vessels intertwined. So there's bone marrow, there is yellow and red bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow consists of mostly fat, and then the red bone marrow is gonna be what we're focusing on today that has the blood cells and stem cells in it. To understand the progression of ALL, it's important to understand hematopoiesis, or the production of blood cells. Normally the bone marrow makes blood stem cells that mature over time and become either myeloid cells or lymphoid cells. So you can see in the diagram here. Myeloid cells become many different types of blood cells. So red blood cells, platelets, or granulocytes, which then become neutrophils, basophils, or eosinophils. A lymphoid stem cell becomes a lymphoblast, and then one of three types of lymphocytes. So B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, are natural killer cells. ALL is characterized by the overproduction and accumulation of malignant B or T lymphoblasts in the bone marrow or, or, or the peripheral blood. Without treatment, ALL quickly progresses and can spread to the lymph nodes, spleen, liver, central nervous system, and other organs. So today we're gonna to be focusing on the B and T cell lymphocytes. According to the National Cancer Institute, in 2020, an estimated 6,150 new cases of ALL will be diagnosed with 1,520 deaths resulting from the disease. ALL is the most commonly diagnosed pediatric malignancy consisting of roughly 3,000 cases a year. So to put this in perspective, think of a good-sized pediatric oncology institution, for example, Vanderbilt. They receive approximately one new ALL case per week. According to the National Cancer Institute, 54.2% of cases in patients are under the age of 20 years old. A sharp peak in ALL incidence occurs between the ages of two and three years old, with the incidence being approximately fourfold greater than that of infants and four to fivefold greater than that of adults. Long-term survival for pediatric patients with ALL has dramatically improved over the past several decades, with now a six-year overall survival approaching 95%, and that of only 50% in adults. The clinical presentation of ALL is typically the result of pancytopenia in this patient population. So if you think about that, anemia, which typically presents as weakness, fatigue, and shortness of breath is frequent in these patients, thrombocytopenia, which causes frequent bruising and bleeding, neutropenia, which can lead to frequent infections, which present as fever, night sweats, and swollen lymph nodes, and then as with any other malignancy, you will see unexpected weight loss in these patients. Okay, so just a quick knowledge checkpoint to make sure everybody's keeping up. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia is characterized by which of the following? Anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, or all of the above? Thank you, Liz. All of the above. So for the classification of ALL, 
This will help us determine the patient's overall treatment status and prognosis. So for instance, T cell ALL is treated slightly differently than B cell ALL with a different prognosis. Same goes for pH positive um, disease. So doc doctors most commonly use the World Health Organization system, which is the first one listed there for you. It's based on the type of malignant lymphocyte and the characteristics the cell has. There are three different subtypes. B cell, which is the most common type, resulting in about 80% of cases of ALL. There's the T cell, which is more common in adolescents and men. And then there is the mature B cell, which is the rarest of all, resulting in about less than 5% of cases. It's also referred to as Burkett's leukemia, which it, because it's similar to Burkett's lymphoma. The next one is the French American British system. This one's an older classification system that's not frequently used now. It does not determine any treatment or overall prognosis for these patients. It solely looks at the morphology of the leukemic cells underneath the microscope. So there's three different groups here, L1, L2, and L3. And it, like I said, it has no effect on determining the treatment or prognosis. However, Philadelphia ALL status does have a huge determining factor with these patients. They, um, the gene itself results when chromosome 9 and chromosome 22 break off and switch places, forming that BCRABL gene. So it can be a target for some of our um, treatment options. So for the status of ALL, these are some definitions that I'm going to go over that will be important throughout the entire slideshow, especially once we get to clinical trials. So just keep these in the back of your mind once I go over them, please. So before I start talking about treatment, it's important to understand the different phases of treatment and where a patient can be during their treatment. When a patient is in remission, there's no evidence of leukemia, meaning that the bone marrow consists of fewer than 5% lymphoblasts. The blood cell counts are within normal limits and there are no signs and symptoms of disease in these patients. While it's a good prognostic factor, remission doesn't always mean the patient is cured. So according to the National Cancer Institute, among children with ALL, approximately 98 will 98% will attain remission during their lifetime. So minimal residual disease, or MRD, is the single most important predictor of long-term prognosis for these patients. Historically, we would give induction therapy and then look at the bone marrow to determine how many lymphoblasts we could find in a given sample. With older technology, pathologists can only detect about one blast within 100 cells. But because PCR technology has now been developed, we can now detect one leukemic blast cell in 10,000 cells. So after induction, if you are MRD negative, that means you did not have a single blast cell within 10,000 cells. That signifies a deep molecular remission, which bodes for a long-term positive outlook. Of note, blenitumumab has a specific indication for helping patients achieve MRD negative status. Active disease obviously means that there is still evidence of leukemia present during treatment or after treatment subsides. Or it can be relapse, which means it comes back after treatment. For a patient to be in relapse, more than 5% of the bone marrow must be made up of blast cells. So I'll get into the treatment of ALL. Treatment is based on several different factors. So we have age, comorbidities, performance status, and then classification of disease like we just covered. Age, comorbidities, and performance status determine how aggressively we can treat a cancer patient. It tells us how much chemotherapy and radiation a patient can handle while still having a meaningful quality of life. So for example, a otherwise healthy pediatric patient can often, handle, can often handle more aggressive treatment, which leads us to more higher percentages of remission or MRD negative status. However, if you have an elderly patient with several other comorbidities, they can often handle the aggressive chemotherapy regimens. Our goals of treatment for ALL include to obtain complete remission with no detectable and minimal residual disease, prevent relapse, and to minimize drug toxicity, and then always provide supportive care for these patients. Before we discuss each phase of ALL treatment, here's a visual overview of the treatment pathway. Patients start with an induction phase and can either move straight to bone marrow transplant or to consolidation phase, which is followed by the maintenance phase, and the entire process takes on average of three years. So during this two and a half to three and a half year process, patients receive CNS prophylaxis throughout the entire course of treatment. I'll talk about CNS prophylaxis first since it is present during each phase of treatment. Emil Fry was a, the first oncologist to treat ALL with multi-agent chemotherapy. He obtained complete remissions as early as the 1960s. He was ecstatic since the idea of giving multi-agent chemotherapy 
was highly criticized because it often resulted in death from the toxicities of these agents. Unfortunately, one by one, these patients came in with a different type of toxicity. They all came in with meningitic ALL and eventually died from this. The, the CNS is a common sanctuary site for leukemia, meaning that this is a site where leukemic cells go and are protected from any systemic chemotherapy. Less than 5% of patients will show CNS disease at the time of diagnosis, but up to 80% of patients that are not treated with CNS prophylaxis will develop meningitic ALL during their course of disease. Most systemic chemotherapy regimens do not cross the blood-brain barrier and are therefore inadequate to treat or prevent leukemic meningitis alone. Intrathecal methotrexate is most commonly used for CNS prophylaxis and is administered during each phase of ALL treatment. The first phase of ALL treatment is the induction phase. The goal is to induce a state of remission, so meaning less than 5% lymphoblast, with minimal residual disease negative status. Various treatment regimens are used for this phase, but the backbone of each regimen is similar. So it consists of vincristine, elisparaginase, a corticosteroid, so methylprednisone or prednisone, and an anthracycline, which is donorubicin or doxorubicin. On average, a patient with on average a patient will have 10 to the 12th leukemic cells when they start treatment. Induction, the induction phase ideally kills 99.9% .9 of these cells, which sounds amazing, but that still leaves us with 10 billion leukemic cells for these patients, which is, which is why we have the need for a consolidation phase and a maintenance phase after this, after this phase is complete. The duration of this phase varies based on when the patient achieves the state of remission. So they will be tested after two to three cycles to see um, what their uh, leukemic status is. So we'll use the PCR testing to do that. The next phase is the consolidation phase. So once induction has completed and the patient has obtained complete remission, we move into the consolidation phase. The goal is to consolidate remission and eradicate any remaining undetectable residual disease. Typically the regimen that is used for induction is the same res regimen used for consolidation, but just at higher doses. Unlike the induction phase, we have no way to really determine a exact duration for this phase since we have no way to test how much disease they have left. Because remember, we just tested to, to get them into remission, we had to test the 1 in 10,000 cells. So the consolidation phase is typically continued for 7 to 8 months. And then we have the maintenance phase. So after completion of induction and consolidation, the goal is to maintain remission and to prevent relapse of disease. The maintenance regimen is an oral regimen of 6-mecaptopurine, weekly oral methotrexate with pulse doses of prednisone and vincristine monthly. The maintenance phase lasts a total of two years. So to talk about relapse, despite major advancements in disease understanding, targetable mutation identification, disease monitoring, relapse or refractory ALL is, it remains a high-risk malignancy. Overall survival drops down from 95% to 50% in children, and it's only 20% in adults. There is currently no standard of care treatment for this unmet medical need. Historically, salvage chemotherapy and possible stem cell transplantation were the mainstays of therapy. But they still remain inadequate for determining long-term disease survival. Immunotherapy is one potential treatment approach for this patient population. Three novel immunotherapy options recently received FDA approval for the treatment of relapse and refractory B-cell ALL. Inotuzumab, which is a humanized CD22 antibody, was FDA approved in 2017. Kimraya, which is a chimeric antigen receptor T cell, it sorry, receptor T cell antigen, also known as CAR T therapy, was also FDA approved in 2017. Blunitumab, which we're going to talk about today, is a CD3 CD19 bispecific T cell engaging monoclonal antibody, or bite therapy. So this is going, this was FDA approved in 2014. It received accelerated approval that year, and then it was formally approved in 2017 with the other regimens. Treatment with these agents should be followed by a bone marrow transplant only if remission is achieved by these agents. So like I said, today we're going to focus on blenitumumab. It is a novel approach to the treatment of relapsed refractory B cell ALL by activating the patient's own immune system. So these are immunotherapies that uh, target the anti-tumor, the natural anti-tumor state in these patients and activate it. At the beginning of the 20th century, Paul Ehrlich 
hypothesized that the immune system played a key role in facilitating anti-tumor activity through both innate and adaptive immune responses. One mechanism now supporting this well-known hypothesis is the uh, tumor antigen presentation on T-cells, resulting in <clears throat> cytotoxic activation and tumor apoptosis. During maturation and development, T and B cells express a variety of antigens contingent upon the patient and which uh, cell cycle they are at in development. Blenitumumab has a dual affinity for both CD3 on T cells and CD19 on B cells. The CD19 antigen is an ideal anti-tumor target because it's not only expressed in nearly 95% of patients with B cell ALL, but it is also vital for the um, survival of the B cell. So it's present at every phase of the B cell development. When binding to CD3, blenitumab causes a transient proliferation of T cells, a release in inflammatory cytokines, and then it mediates production of cytotoxic proteins, all of which result in cell lysis of CD positive B cells. The consequence of this T cell mediated lysis is that it not only kills malignant B cells, but it also kills normal B cells. So the dosing for blenitumab is a weight-based approach. It consists of two induction cycles, three consolidation cycles, and then patients may continue to require up to an additional four cycles to achieve remission. For patients less than 45 kilos, blenitumumab is a dose based on body surface area, starting at five micrograms per, kilo, or per millimeter squared uh, for the first seven days, and then we step up to 15 micrograms per meter squared thereafter for a total of 48 days per cycle. Each cycle ends with a 14-day 14, 14 treatment-free period. For patients greater than or equal to 45 kilos, blenitumab is administered at a fixed dose of 9 micrograms daily for the first 7 days. And then we go up to 28 micrograms daily for the, for the remainder of the cycle, followed by the same 14-day treatment-free interval. There is no clini clinically meaningful impact on blenitumab clearance in patients with a creatinine clearance above 30. So for patients with mild to moderate renal impairment, there are no dose adjustments that need to be made for blenitumumab. For patients on hemodialysis or with a creatinine clearance less than 30, this, is, this patient population has not been studied, so no recommendations were made at this time. Blenitumumab has minimal hepatic clearance, therefore there are no hepatic adjustments recommended at this time either. So since we are pharmacists, preparation of this medication is one of the vital steps we need to remember and to watch out for. So blenitumumab comes in a box with two vials. One is the dry powder of the drug, and the other is the liquid drug stabilizer. The drug comes in a 35 microgram vial to which you add three mils of sterile water to yield a 12.5 microgram per milliliter concentration. You gently swirl the vial, and then you add the necessary amount of normal saline to an empty IV bag. You then add the 5.5 mils of the drug stabilizer, which contains citric acid monohydrate, lysine hydrochloride, polysorbate, and then sodium hydroxide. You then transfer the necessary amount of the drug into the IV bag. Pharmacy students then remove the remaining air from the IV bag and prime the administration with the drug, not just normal saline. The drug can be stored in the refrigerator until it's ready for use. Of note, all bags, tubing, etc., should be DHP free and a 0.2 micron filter should be used for all infusions. So commonly there are two types of errors that occur when this is made. So like I said, there are two vials that come in the box so that one of them is the dry powder and one of them is the drug stabilizer. So sometimes whenever this is reconstituted, they will inject the drug stabilizer directly into the dry powder and try to reconstitute it that way. Another common mistake that's often made is that instead of adding the normal saline to the bag, then the drug stabilizer, then the drug, they add the drug before the drug stabilizer. So when this happens, we don't know the stability of the medication and it must be remade. And you'll see why it's a problem when I talk about cost. So blenitumab can be infused over 24 hours or 48 hours. This choice is up to the healthcare provider and it just depends on the frequency of the bag changes. So the cycle is going to be the same amount of days. It just depends on how often the bag needs to be changed on the ambulatory pump. Due to the inherent risk of cytokine release syndrome that I will discuss more later, it is imperative that the healthcare team diligently monitors these patients whenever the cycle begins. The REMS program for blenitumumab specifically requires hospitalization for the first nine days of the first cycle and for the first two days of the second cycle. After the initial hospitalization, the patient has an ambulatory pump that they take home with them for each infusion, so that way these patients can still do normal daily activities. 
Of note, if the infusion is interrupted for more than four hours, the infusion should be restarted in the hospital. If it's interrupted for more than eight hours, the dose for that day should be started over. So I've listed here for you just an example of what the administration looks like. So for a 24 hour infusion duration at nine micrograms per day, it's gonna be 10 mils per hour infusion rate. The same for the 28 micrograms per day at the 24 hour infusion. For the 48 hour infusion, we go down to a dose of four, uh, five mils per hour. So that's just gonna be a more concentrated drug. That's what that's gonna be. So just to give you an example of what those look like. Okay, so now to talk about cost. Despite the immense promise that ALL provides for the treatment of, I'm sorry, that blintumab provides for the treatment of ALL, it's a high cost treatment option with significant logistical concerns for both patients and healthcare providers. So I've laid out an example for you here of what a cycle cost would be for a patient weighing greater than 45 kilos. So week one at nine micrograms per day is two vials for that week. Week two at 28 micrograms per day, that's gonna be six vials for that week. It's gonna be the same dosing cycle for weeks three and four. So if you add all those up, that's gonna be 20 vials at $4,807 per vial. It's for totaling $96,140 for one induction, induction cycle. And as we talked about before, map can go for up to nine cycles. So it's gonna create a large uh, cost burden for these patients. As with any medication, I wanna talk about the adverse effects. Our, Two primary concerns with blenitumab and the other immunotherapies as well is the first two I have listed here, cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. I will talk about those specifically in just a minute, but some other ones we can see are neutropenia, infection, and then as with any infusion, infusion-related reactions. The National Cancer Institute developed the common terminology criteria for adverse events, which is a specific grading system utilized for categorizing significant adverse events with chemotherapy. Grade one is asymptomatic or mild symptoms requiring no intervention. Grade two is moderate symptoms with minimal, local, or non-invasive intervention required. Grade three is life-threatening consequences with urgent intervention required. Grade four is the same life-threatening consequences, but requires hospitalization or prolongation of hospitalization. And grade five is symptoms that usually result in death. Cytokine release, release syndrome is a commonly occurring adverse event of these targeted cellular therapies, including blenitumab and then Chimera, like I talked about earlier. Cytokine release syndrome, or CRS, is an immediate and robust global inflammatory response in these patients. It, it's, a, it's a production of inflammatory markers and cytokines that occurs with varying degrees of severity. The onset of cytokine release syndrome occurs shortly after the first dose, manifesting its symptoms of fever, hypotension, hypoxia, headache, and rash. The stepwise approach of, an, of initiating blenitumab was designed specifically to minimize the risk of cytokine release syndrome. Data from clinical trials regarding cytokine release syndrome reactions demonstrate an increase in cytokine levels that peak during the first one to three days of therapy. This directly correlates with the dump of cytokines from this medication. Subsequent doses or cycles result in a less pronounced effect due to the diminished tumor burden at this time. Recommendations for preventing cytokine release syndrome with blenitumab include the step-up therapy that we already talked about and then an initial low-dose uh, seven-day infusion period along with dexamethasone prophylaxis. The treatment of cytokine release syndrome involves... Um, it involves the discontinuation of therapy as well as dexamethasone present um, administration, sorry. So for grade three cytokine release syndrome, it is defined as hypotension managed with one oppressor or hypoxia requiring 40% oxygen, requires the treatment interruption for at least three days and until symptom resolution, which is defined as grade one or lower the symptoms for on the uh, grading toxicity that I showed you earlier. Dexamethasone administration at eight milligrams or five milligrams per meter squared is recommended in patients weighing greater than or equal to 45 kilos or less than 45 kilos respectively. So you administer dexamethasone every eight hours for three days. For grade three, you can re-challenge blenitumab upon symptom resolution. For grade four, which is life-threatening consequences requiring urgent intervention, blenitumab must be immediately and permanently discontinued. Dexamethasone can be administered every eight hours for three days at the same dosing as before. 
another treatment option when we, when we hit grade four is tocolizumab. It's an interleuc interleukin six antagonist. So this is it, uh, when this is administered, it helps mediate the systemic inflammatory response that's present with cytokine release syndrome. The dosing of tocolizumab is eight milligrams per kilo infused over 60 minutes, and it may be give, given up to three additional doses at least eight hours apart. So for neurotoxicity, it's another major concern that can result from the administration of blenitumab and the other immunotherapies. The underlying pathophysiologic mechanism isn't, isn't known for neurotoxicity, as well as the factors that predispose patients to this toxicity. Symptoms include severe headaches, tremors, confusion, loss of balance, seizures, and encephalopathy. These symptoms commonly manifest within the first week of therapy and then subside similar to cytokine release syndrome. While medications such as dexamethasone can be administered to relieve these symptoms, um, the symptoms of neurologic toxicity may not be, always be reversible. Okay, so another knowledge checkpoint. What patient population accounts for the majority of ALL cases? Children 0 to 17 years old, young adults 18 to 30, or adults greater than 30 years old? What did you say? A. A. All right, guys, it's the pediatric cancer. <laughs> Children 0 to 17 years old. Okay, so now I'm going to jump into the clinical trials for blenitumumab. There are a lot of them, so I did try to summarize the important ones in this table for you. To date, numerous phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials evaluating the safety and efficacy of blenitumumab in acute lymphoblastic leukemia have been conducted with several others in progress. The first three studies listed are performed by Top and colleagues. The first was an open-label multi-center single-arm pilot study. It was the first phase two clinical trial to evaluate blenitumumab in patients with refractory B-cell ALL. The primary outcome was to determine the minimal residual disease response rate. Of the 20 patients studied, 80% achieved complete minimal residual disease response by the end of the first cycle of blenitumumab. The second study was the first clinical trial to evaluate blenitumumab in Philadelphia negative relapsed and refractory B-cell ALL. This open-label multi-center single-arm dose-finding phase two clinical trial evalu evaluated blenitumumab in 36 patients. The study also found that the step-up therapy with a lower dose during the first week of therapy and then the higher dose for the remainder of the, the cycle was a gi giant decrease in adverse effects for these patients. So as you can see for the numbers there, um, only 6% had cytokine release syndrome and 17% experienced grade three or higher neurotoxicity. The third study by Top and colleagues sought to evaluate the safety and efficacy of blenitumumab. This study was not only, not only used the step up approach for dosing, but also used the weight-based dosing. So they were the first ones that dosed based on 40, greater than 45 kilos or less than 45 kilos. Of the 198 patients, only 2% experienced cytokine release syndrome and 13% reported neurotoxicity. In this trial, 33% of patients achieved complete remission with minimal residual disease negative status in 82% of patients. This pivotal trial granted blenitumumab accelerated FDA approval in 2014 for the treatment of adults with um, Philadelphia negative relapsed and refractory B-cell ALL. The next trial, the Alcantara trial, was an open-label, multi-center, single-arm phase two cl clinical trial that studied the use of blenitumumab in adults with Philadelphia-positive relapsed refractory ALL. The primary endpoint of complete remission was achieved in 31% of patients. Of note, 88% of patients demonstrated complete MRD response with a median overall survival of 6.7 months. So the next trial I wanna focus on is the TOWER trial. So following accelerated approval of blenitumumab, this randomized control International Phase Three clinical clinical trial was conducted evaluating overall survival in relapsed and refractory B cell ALL. Receiving um, so patients received open label blenitumumab versus second line second line chemotherapy. This prospective multi center randomized randomized Phase Three clinical trial enrolled 405 patients, which were randomized in a two to one fashion 
across 101 centers in 21 countries to receive either a fixed dose blenitumab or the investigator's choice of chemotherapy. The primary endpoint of overall, overall survival was defined as the time for randomization to the time of death. So the results for this trial, the trial was stopped early due to benefit observed with blenitumumab. Overall survival was significantly longer in the blenitumumab group with 7.7 .7 months versus four months in the chemotherapy group. Remission rates within 12 weeks after treatment initiation were significantly longer at 34% versus 16% in the chemotherapy group. Duration of remission, again, was, was longer at 7.3 months versus 4.6 months in the chemotherapy group. Adverse events were equally reported across both groups. So here I just want to highlight the adverse events. So like I said, they're similar across both groups, 98% adverse events reported in the blenitumab group and 99.1% in the chemotherapy group. But as expected, in the blenitumab group, we had a higher rate of these toxicities that are a result of immunotherapy. So there was 9.4% neurologic events in the blenitumab group and 4.9% experienced cytokine release syndrome. So to conclude, to wrap up the TOWER trial, there was significant survival benefit with blenitumab as a single agent immunotherapy compared with chemotherapy. Blenitumab had longer periods of complete remission and overall survival. Neurologic events and cytokine release syndrome were more common with blenitumab as we expected. And the FDA confirmed approval for blenitumab for adult patients with relapse or refractory B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So last knowledge checkpoint, what patient population was included in the TOWER trial? Adults with newly diagnosed B-cell ALL, adults and children with relapse or refractory B-cell ALL, adults with relapse or refractory B-cell ALL, or D, adults with relapse or refractory B or T-cell ALL. Try again. <laughs> C. C. All right, so this, this specifically looked at adults with relapse or refractory B cell ALL. So based on our last knowledge checkpoint, what patient population has the most common incidence of ALL? Children. Children. So our trial that got it approved was, was studied in adults. So I do want to point out some of the novel pediatric clinical trials with blenitumumab. So I'm just going to summarize all of these for you. A total of 161 pediatric patients were studied in all of these trials. The primary efficacy outcomes included complete remission rates, relapse-free survival, minimal residual disease status, and stem cell transplant rates. Overall, 51% of patients experienced a complete remission following blenitumab treatment with a relapse-free survival rate at 30%. Furthermore, 36% of blenitumab patients experienced the minimal residual disease negative remission. Nearly 42% of patients went on to receive stem cell transplantation after they achieved remission. Low-grade low grade cytokine release syndrome, so meaning grade 3 or less, or I'm sorry, le less than grade 3, was common among pediatric patients. However, it was only reported in 5% of patients when it, was greater, when it was grade 3 or higher. So we're not really sure why it occurred less in pediatric patients, but it was found to be significantly less than in the adult trials. The same goes for the neurotoxicity. It was only documented in 2% of pediatric patients. So I do want to highlight this top trial um, by Von Stackelberg. It was the primary study that led to FDA approval in children. So in conclusion, there are a lot of phase three trials that are up and coming for blenitumumab, but it was the first bite therapy to be FDA approved. Based on the TOWER trial, blenitumumab was superior to, superior to standard chemotherapy for overall survival response rate and event-free survival for relapsed refractory B-cell ALL. Adverse events for blenitumumab, including cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity, may require permanent, discontin permanent discontinuation in some patients. Blenitumumab was demonstrated with both safety and efficacy as monotherapy in relapsed refractory B-cell ALL, and its role in the frontline therapy is still under investigation. With that, what questions do you have? Yes, Megan. So, cytokine release syndrome looks like it's a very much mimic sepsis, the way the patients present. So, how do you differentiate between whether a patient has sepsis or cytokine release syndrome after the therapy? Right. So, these patients. Okay, sorry, repeat the question. 
So Megan asked how to differentiate between sepsis in these patients versus cytokine release syndrome. So with this patient population, they are going to be in the hospital specifically for the administration of blenitumab. So obviously we're going to know whether these patients were infectious or presented with sepsis-like symptoms before we start administration. And then it's going to be a very specific response within the first one to three days of therapy. So um, it's kind of assumed if they present with those symptoms or develop those symptoms within the first one to three days of therapy, that it would be cytokine release syndrome and we would treat it appropriately. Yes, Liz. Um, if you said this already, I apologize, but you mentioned the 24 hour infusion versus 48 mm -hmm. hours. Why would you select one versus the other? Right. So Liz asked why you would choose the 24-hour infusion cycle versus the 48-hour infusion cycle. So that's going to be a healthcare provider specific thing that they pick. And it's just going to determine how often they have to change out the, um, the bag for the infusion. So this is also based on like logistically how, quick, how quickly can patients get back to the hospital. You know, patients that live farther away and have trouble getting back for their um, bag change, they could be candidates for the 48 hour infusion cycle, but there is no set standard of who gets which infusion cycle. Are we doing this therapy here? Uh, it is some, it's seen some in the children's hospital, but not in adults. Yes. So Andrea asked where I see this uh, treatment going and kind of following into the treatment pathway in coming years in the pediatric population. So I can definitely see this becoming a first line option and being moved into the induction phase of um, treatment for this pa for these patients. So it was studied in the relapsed and refractory group, but as we uh, have more clinical trials and study in the induction group, I can definitely see it making its way in there, especially with its overall survival. Um, indications. I think all of you know how to collect your CE, so here's the code. And everyone, I forgot um, to print out Tabitha's evaluation forms, so I'll be sending that out via email if you wouldn't mind filling that out and then turning that into Andrea. Or you can put it on my desk and I can turn it into Instead of a walk. Thank you.